In Letters from England, 1807, Robert Southey declared that there is certainly no race of people who delight so passionately as the English in fox hunting. This paper is about this particular delight, this Georgian pleasure, so to speak, and about the literature which surrounded it in late Georgian England. Most of my talk will address two books, Peter Beckford's Thoughts on Hunting, 1781, a volume which prompted the huge expansion of sports writing in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, and the Memoirs of the Life of the Late John Mitton Esquire, 1835, by C. J. Appley, Charles James Appley, who used the pseudonym Nimrod after the mighty hunter in scripture. This is the biography of a fox hunting squire, drunkard and spendthrift John Mitten, who, according to Appley, had a violent love of pleasure. I'll begin, however, by briefly sketching the key context to these books, late Georgian sports in general and late Georgian sporting literature. One of the principal Georgian pleasures was sport, both playing and watching sport. Spectator sport, indeed, became increasingly popular throughout the 18th century. This is not to say, of course, that watching sport is anything new. As Chaucer says in the 14th century Parliament of Fowls, for many a man that may not stund a pull, yet liketh him at a wrestling fall to be. However, the 18th century is significant as a, people, as a period where people began to pay in large numbers to watch sports, notably boxing, cricket, and horse racing. As early as 1743, as the sports historian Richard Holt has noted, around 10,000 people attended the artillery ground, Finsbury, for a cricket match. By the early 19th century, around twice that number, in the boxing journalist Piers Egan's account, could congregate to watch the September 1811 championship fight between the two Toms, Crib and Molyneux, one of the pivotal moments in late Georgian sport. And, this is Holt again, by the early 19th century, Epsom was said to be attracting crowds of over 100,000 people on Derby Day. Prompted by such enthusiasms, a burgeoning sporting press developed. The period between the 1780s and the 1830s possesses a rich body of writing pertaining to sport. In newspaper, literary journalism and satirical jeremiad, and in novel, graphic caricature and broadsheet, the sporting preoccupations of the English were reported, celebrated and sometimes condemned. Sport generated huge amounts of literary activity, spawning innovative forms of publishing which served a seemingly insatiable public appetite for sports-related books and journalism. There were certainly, indeed, unprecedented numbers of press columns on the subject. Newspapers covered sport in greater detail than ever before. Specialist magazines and periodicals devoted in part or whole to sport were established, most notably the Sporting Magazine, founded in October 1792, and several literary journals, Blackwood's Edinburgh Magazine being the most significant, enthusiastically championed sports, especially those of the so-called fancy, the crowd who favoured bare-knuckle boxing and the sports of the field. The rise of sports publishing is one of the great success stories of late Georgian print culture. Enterprising publishers began to take sport seriously as an income generator, producing a range of new or hitherto undeveloped forms of sporting literature. Advice manuals, the early sporting biographies, lavishly illustrated and expensive collections of prints and satires, picaresque tales of amusing cockney sportsmen, the tradition that ends up uh, in reading its apogee in the early numbers of the Pickwick Papers in 1836, encyclopedias of sport, almanacs, memoirs, commemorative broadsheets, popular songs, and so on. There are also important moral issues at stake here. Sport in this period was an activity which generated much literary debate about its wider social and ideological significance. Sport was eulogised as morally improving, pedagog pedagogical in its 
inculcation of a noble, courageous and manly spirit and seen as being of great importance to the building of, of national and personal character. It was also condemned as offering decidedly darker lessons, a brutish relish for cruel and squalid spectacle, a taste for gambling, a carelessness of the suffering of animals. Then, as now, there were people who saw the national temper, identified the national temper in terms of sport. In 1819, the satirist and critic John Wilson of Blackwood's magazine declared that the character of a people is to be sought for and found in their sporting amusements. Now, the amusement which Wilson identified as most emblematic of the British spirit was that con most contentious of all late Georgian sports, uh, uh, excepting, of course, uh, bull and bear baiting, bare knuckle boxing. For pugilistic pressmen such as John Wilson and Piers Egan, the fighter represented the national character stripped to white breeches. Here, as so often in the period, the amusements of the people became an arena for debating issues of national character, of manliness and masculinity, and those of race, social class, and gender. Much of this new literature of sport was inspired by the success of one particular book, which was published in Salisbury in 1781, Peter Beckford's groundbreaking and best-selling Thoughts on Hunting. Beckford, a wealthy absentee landlord of several West Indian uh, sugar plantations, is known to historians hereabout as the cuckold of his husband, the notorious William Beckford, Gothic novelist, connoisseur, and builder of the Tower at Lansdowne, who conducted an affair with Peter's wife, Louisa Beckford, in Bath in the 1780s but he's rather better known in his day as a sporting writer. And his successors frequently dated the beginning of the modern forms of sporting literature to Beckford. In 1832, for instance, the new sporting magazine declared that nothing, in short, appeared as worthy the attention of, uh, sorry, nothing appeared worthy of the attention of sporting people until Mr. Beckford published his thoughts on hunting. So, though Beckford's by no means the first English author to write about hunting in general, and fox hunting in particular, nonetheless, he tended to be regarded as so by his contemporaries, and he was undeniably the most influential. John Lawrence, for example, uh, declares in his British Field Sports, 1818, that Mr. Beckford has so well described our present practice of fox hunting, and given such solid and rational advice on the subject, that his thoughts have become from the date of their first publication, the general textbook on this subject. All people who delight in field sports should be in possession of it. The thoughts on hunting is deservedly the best oracle on our subject. Beckford's writing on the chase inspired some of the principal literary sportsmen of the late Georgian age, most significantly Charles James Appley, commonly known as Nimrod, and Robert Smith Surtees, uh, AKA Nim South, uh, in a tradition which endured until the early 20th century, um, principally in Siegfried Sassoon's Memoirs of a Fox Hunting Man, 1928. Nimrod made his name with The Chase, The Turf, and The Road, published in the quarterly, uh, sorry, the quarterly, uh, quarterly Review in 1831 and 1832, and The Memoirs of the Life of John Mitten, the first best selling sports biography, and a book about which I will have rather more to say later. Surtees' uh, succession of hunt-related tales began with Jorix's Jaunts and Jollities, which was serialised in the new sporting magazine, the, period, the periodical which Surtees owned and edited between 1831 and 1834. And it's a tradition which continues late into the Victorian age. Hunting literature, it should be pointed out, did not simply attract the sportsman or the sportswoman. There were many who, to use Nimrod's fine phrase, rode to hounds on paper over a bottle of wine by a good fireside. Hunting, indeed, seems to have had an enduring imaginative pull on many readers who had never seen the backside of a horse. Or, as Virginia Woolf puts it rather more eloquently 
in a 1932 review of memoirs of, of, of the Mitten memoir. This is Wolf. The great English sports are pursued almost as fiercely by sedentary men who cannot sit a donkey and by quiet women who cannot drown a mouse as by the booted and spurred. They hunt in imagination. What a beautiful phrase that is. They follow the fortunes of the Barclay, the Catiscop, the Quorn and the Beaver upon phantom hunters. They roll upon their lips the odd sounding, beautifully crabbed English place names. Humblebee, Doddles Hill, Caroline Bog, Winnie at Break. They imagine as they read, hanging to a strap on the underground, or popping the paper up against a suburban teapot, at now a slow twisting hunt, now a brilliant gallop. For decades after its publication, Beckford's thoughts, colourful, frenetic and graceful in simultaneity, had a hold on the literary and visual imagination, as Beckford's work and those of his successors appeared often with handsome colour plates by the like of the famous uh, sporting artist Henry Alkin, who illustrated both uh, Beckford and later Alkin. So, the gathering in the crisp morning, the blast of the master's horn, the barking hounds who have caught the scent, the guts and fearlessness of the red-coated riders, the camaraderie of the hunt at full pelt. These images of the chase appeal to sporting and non-sporting readers alike. Fox hunting's furious dynamic, riders, horses, hounds and fox in rapid sequence, possessed a potent visceral and visual appeal, at least to those unsqueamish of vulpine uh, agonies. Indeed, the implacable and pitiless resolution of the chase in the kill was part of its appeal and the principal cause at the same time of the controversies which it provoked because it was not only in the 20th and 21st centuries that sport was contentious. Though its elite social status ensured it would not go the way of ungenteel blood sports such as cockfighting, bull and bear baiting, which are prohibited by the Cruelty to Animals Act of 1835, there was much contemporary opinion which condemned fox hunting amongst evangelicals, working class radicals, utilitarians, folks who maintained that fox hunting was cruel, brutalizing and beyond the pale in ethical terms as the moneyed pleasure, sorry, the tainted pleasure of the moneyed classes. But that sadly is not a plate which I have time to spin today. To many, however, the hunt was displaced drama, enacting some of the most notable conventions of the tragedian's art, passion, blood, death, and fear, though not often pity. Certainly, fox hunting was faster and more dramatic than ever at the turn of the 19th century, and for very particular reasons. The new breeding methods, evident in early 18th century horse raiding, racing, eventually facilitated the development of swifter hunting animals. There are also the canine breeding innovations, often associated with the famous Hugo Maynell, master of foxhounds of the elite corn hunt in Leicestershire, which survives to this day. The squire Maynell, possessed of a certain hell for leather approach, favoured an extended chase through open lands at high speeds, turning fox hunting into a kind of late Georgian extreme sport. Because of the improvements of Maynell and others, the relatively more sedate early 18th century <coughs> form of fox hunter gave way to what Surtees called the bang up, slap dash, breakneck, out and out hunting artist. So this hard riding manner was fo followed by all kinds of hunts, from the socially rarefied, such as the beaver and the corn, down to the cockney, in inverted commas, subscription hunts, uh, such, given such vigorous life in R.S. Surtees, RS Surtees novels. After decades as a minority sport, which lacked the cachet of stag hunting or the popularity of hare hunting, fox hunting became the preeminent, preeminent form of the chase, to the point where William Osbaldiston, in the British Sportsman, published in 1792, could declare that fox hunting is now considered as the only chase in England worthy of the taste and attention of high-bred sportsmen. Beckford's work 
published towards the end of the 18th century, adopts the epistolary form so common in the period's literature. In advice literature, such as Lord Chesterfield's letter to his son of 1774, and in the period's novels, such as Richardson's Pamela, of Virtue Rewarded, in a series of letters, 1740 to 1741. Beckford's book consists of 24 letters to a friend, instructing the same in the ways of the chase, how to choose, breed, feed and whip, and train the hound, the manners of the hunt, the view to the kill, and so on and so on. The first uh, cha uh, chapter sets the scene. The subject introduced, hunting recommended, not only as an entertaining, but also as a wholesome exercise. So, the thoughts on hunting betrays fox hunting as a rough-hewn school for ethics, possessed of a deep moral significance. Beckford sees hunting as a vigorous, ethically improving and manly pastime. This sport is a kind of warfare. Its uncertainties, its fatigues, its difficulties and its dangers, rendering it interesting beyond all other diversions. So this kind of, it will make a soldier out of him rhetoric is really common in the sporting literature of the period. So sports writers frequently invited the British public to see in a chase or a boxing match or even a cockfight a symbol of the martial conflicts of the age and indeed to learn lessons from them as to the appropriate way for the nation and for a man to conduct itself and himself in times of war. For Beckford, the chase also possessed a camaraderie which brought men, and sometimes women, together. One, quote, foreign to a solitary and selfish amusement such as angling, which he calls a dull diversion. And Beckford also takes pains to distance his sport from the hallooing oafs of recent picaresque fiction. So this strenuous squire, classically educated, fluent in several, uh, several languages, and highly erudite, despised the image of the hunting squire, a la Squire Weston in Henry Fielding's Tom Jones. So if, you, if, you're not, you don't know, if you're not familiar with him, imagine Brian Blessed in full roar, and you get a sense of, of what Squire Weston is like. The intemperance, clownishness, and ignorance of the old fox hunter is completely worn out in this day and age. So the sport, Beckford believes, is now become the amusement of gentlemen, and nor need any gentleman be ashamed of it. Beckford's book offers a mixture of detailed instruction, abstract generalization, poetic citation, and imaginative description. He ranges from the humdrum to the impassioned, from the prosaic to the poetic. He is certainly unafraid of the mundane and commonsensical. Beckford relishes detail, possessing something of the monomaniacal instructor about him. So all hunting life is here. The quality of good huntsmen and whippers in are defined and individuated. Readers are show how to recognise cover where foxes like to lie best. Owners of dogs who are missing are ad advised to, quote, leave the straw house door open at night to facilitate the prodigal's return. Those whose hounds are much troubled with worms can find medical advice, although Beckford's, uh, Beckford's remedies have something of the kill or cure about them. Some of them feature arsenic and other such things. So to owners of dogs with psychological problems, Beckford represents a treatise on canine lun lunacy, recently written by Dr. James, is worth your reading. And Beckford has this particular pleasure in, uh, in canine taxonomy, and there's a brilliant chapter of the thoughts on the naming of dogs. So page after page of the thoughts is devoted to a catalogue of hounds' names, the canine equivalent of a modern-day book or dictionary of children's names from Abel, antic and the rather less promising awful through to warrior wildfire and the probably hard to train reekful however one would kind of question the sanity of someone to name a dog after some of beckford's suggestion baneful ghastly and hideous the catalogue also manifests a certain uh, cheerful libertinism amongst its bitches buxom blousy comely harlot even strumpet alongside a measure of canine neoclassicism, Kerebus and Diane, but also Daphne, Sappho and Phoebus. Some pastoral names are, however, ruled out as tired and cliched. Damons and Delias I have left out. 
Well, Beckford's the only print record of the world of late 18th century fox hunting to survive. It would be possible to recreate that world from his treatise. Not for nothing does John, Lu uh, John Lawrence describe his book as part oracle and part general textbook. In the fashion which was become very familiar in the sporting literature of the late Georgian age, Beckford waxed patriotic about his favourite pastime. The British chase is the best that can be found, as are this nation's hunting dogs. The hounds which this country produces are universally allowed to be the best in the world. So a sportsman, Beckford argues, and again this is proleptic of much late Georgian, early 19th century sporting talk, uh, combines physical prowess with mental agility. A sportsman demonstrates the undaunted courage of our island race, a quick head, a quick apprehension, activity of body, a good ear and a good voice. So as so often in the sports writing of the period, the author espouses a notion of British exceptionalism. Hunting is a manly and a wholesome exercise, and it seems by nature designed to the amusement of a Briton. Much of the appeal of Beckford's prose lies in the semi-fictionalised descriptions in, in his book, a series of set pieces descriptions of the chase, rather than the aforesaid technical information, the compelling narrative sections of the thoughts on hunting. And it's kind of linguistically remarkable, the book, that much of it is written in the, in the, in the present tense. Think of Wolf Hall and so on. And, and this is very unusual for 18th century prose. So the book, in its use of the conversational present tenses, conjures up a sense of immediacy with the reader addressed as if he or she were present. We feel as if we're in Beckford's own company in this familiar prose. Ha, ah, a check. Now for a moment's patience. We press too close upon the hounds. Huntsman, stand still, as yet they want you not. How admirably they spread, how wide they cast. Is there a single hound that does not try? If such a one there be, he ne'er shall hunt again. There, Truman is on the scent. Tis right, how readily they join him. See those wide casting hounds, how they fly forward to recover the ground they have lost. Mind lightning, how she dashes, and Mungo, how he works. Old frantic too, now pushes forward. She knows as well as me, as well as, uh, as, well as we, the fox is sinking. So the dogs, their names like allegorical personifications, Truman, Mischief, Vengeance, add to the power, even the sublimity of the scene, as if John Bunyan had taken to the chase. The frequent exclamation points which Beckford used add to the urgency, the pace of the prose, echoing that of the hunt as it rises to its climax. Now be quiet, and he cannot escape us and we have the winds of the hounds, and cannot be better placed. How short he runs. He is now on the very strongest part of the cover. What a crash. Every hound is in, and every hound is running for him. That was a quick turn. Again, another. He's put to his last shift. Now mischief is at his heel, and death is not, too, is not far off. Ah, they all stop at once. All silent, and yet no earth is open. Listen, now they are at him again. This is unusual prose for the 18th century, urgent, insistent, and unperiphrastic, a plain idiom devoid of Latin addiction, and generally composed of words of few syllables. Here we have a certain spare, spare and sparse poeticality, a sense of the sublimity and the momentous at work in the field. Now mischief is at his heels, and the death is not far off. Little dreadnought, how he works him, the terriers, too, they now are squeaking at him. How close vengeance pursues. How terribly she presses. It is just up with him. God, what a crash they make. The whole wood resounds. That term was very short. There, now, I, they have him. It is just up with him. God's. There's a kind of um, implacable paganism about some of this prose. The Iliad of Virgil as Nimrod reminds us in the chase, ends with a death, and so does Beckford's narrative. Okay, I want to turn now uh, and move forward from uh, Beckford's work of the 1780s to consider Charles James Appley, 1778 to 1843. Nimrod, 
active as a sporting author in the 1820s through to the early 1840s. Appley was a patrician, public school, journalist, sports historian, novelist and poet, but his most notable works are autobiographical uh, and deal with fox hunting. The Chase, The Turf and The Road, written for the prestigious Quarterly Review at J.G. Lockett's invitation in 1831 and 1832, uh, which is an account of modern fox hunting and other equine sports, and the sensational memoirs of the life of the late John Mitten, his life of the maniacal fox hunting square, uh, squire, John Mitten. The Mitten memoir became the first best-selling sports biography. Here is uh, John Mitten. And Nimrod, it seems to me, should be afforded a minor place in literary history because of his status as a generic pioneer of the sporting biography, especially the sensational biography that trades on adversity and so on in the manner of Lance Armstrong, dare I say it, and, and others. So, certainly his status as a generic pioneer was evident during his day. So R.S. Sertes, who hated Nimrod and whom Nimrod hated back, was aware of the importance of, of, of the book. And he writes after that, the latter's death, that in writing about sporting contemporaries, Nimrod has introduced a new style of literature, the sporting personal, in other words, the sporting biography. This remarkable work is a biography, uh, sorry, a biography of the sportsman John Mitten, 1796 to 1834 a figure well known, or perhaps more properly notorious, in the sporting circle of his day. Mad Jack Mitten, master of Holston Hall, Shropshire, was a squire, six bottle man, spendthrift, and highly eccentric master of foxhounds. So Appley's biography records his jokes and drolleries, and indeed his utter and self-destructive recklessness. Mitten, says Nimrod, had a violent love of pleasure, Mitten spent, and I quote again, hundreds of thousands of pounds on pleasure. So it's very much a book about the nature of the pleasure that, Nim, uh, that Mitten experiences. So what were those pleasures? What manner of man was this? There was that about him, says Nimrod, which resembled the, rec the, uh, the, the restlessness of the hyena. This was a person who hunted in his nightshirt on frozen winter evenings. A man who was an enthusiastic dogfighter. Uh, in the sense of fighting the animals himself, rather than in the kind of traditional sports in inverted commas of, the of having the dogs fighting themselves. So his favourite method of quelling his canine opponents is to bite on their snouts and... Uh, and, 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 and um... So this is also a gambler uh, who won hundreds of pounds at Doncaster Races. So this is, a, this is the, uh, one of the plates by Olken from the Mitten biography. So this is a gambler who won hundreds of pounds at Doncaster Races, only to lose all of the money through the windows of his carriage as he lay asleep in an alcoholic stupor. This was a husband who was rumoured to have put his wife's lapdog on the fire in a jealous rage, though Nimrod takes great pains to deny this as a scurrilous, uh, a scurrilous lie. So born into great mischief, Mitten, uh, sorry, great wealth and mischief, Mitten was, according to Appley, a man mad, half by nature, half by wine, Indeed, indeed of port wine, rather than table wine, though latterly brandy, and finally whatever, including eau de cologne, could be smuggled past the eyes of his despairing mother, who nursed him towards the end of his life. Mitten, unsurprisingly, died of the delirium tremens at the age of 38 in debtor's prison. Thinking about his friend's life, Nimrod saw the sense of pleasure which he possessed close aligned to madness. and close aligned towards the end of Mitten's life to what the Freudians call Thanatos, the death instinct. So this is towards the end of the book. Mitten, said I, I come to tell you that your doctors assure me you will be a corpse in three days unless you give up drinking brandy. So much the better, he replied, I wish to die. That is not the speech of a man of your good understanding, I observed. You may yet see happy days if you will give up drinking brandy. Although there may be a pleasure in madness, madmen only know it is harrowing to the feel feelings of others 
to behold it. So the notion of uh, the extremity of pleasure. So in its June 1834 obituary of Squire Mitten, the gentleman of the magazine noted that he was an enthusiast in the sports of the field and passionately fond of fox hunting and racing, which rendered him well known in the fashionable and sporting societies of England. However, the journal was forced to imply that Squire John had an inconvenient side to his character. Mitten was endowed with a good natural intellect, which by due cultivation might have shown forth in a superior light. His manners were courteous and affable, but his disposition was marked by eccentricities and irregularities which greatly impaired his fortunes. So to go from a, uh, an estate of £60,000 and separately £10,000 a year to death as a bankrupt in the King's, Bre uh, King's Bench Prison before the age of 40 certainly betokened some degree of impairment of fortune. John Mitten became notorious as the most madcap of late Georgian uh, fox hunters and sportsmen. And he was a, con a decidedly contentious figure. The Literary Gazette wrote about his death brutally and without the euphemism of the Gentleman's Magazine in its October 1835 uh, review, a very antipathetic review of Nimrod's, of, of Nimrod's book. Within a few years, this man sported away uh, fine estates. He sported away half a million pounds of money to die a prisoner. He sported down his iron constitution to perish a poor drunkard. So one man's eccentric is another's drunken fool. At the same time, while busily denouncing Squire Jack and Nimrod's indiscretions, the Gazette reviewer did not forget to quote liberally from the reprehensible text under discussion. And there's an air of disingenuousness about this. Mitten's life produced copy too good to miss. And the Gazette reviewer ensures that his disapproval is accompanied by large and long quotations of some of Nimrod's choicest anecdotes. The biography was published uh, when, uh, Mitten was, uh, sorry, when Nimrod was living in Calais to escape his, uh, his, own, um, uh, to escape his own debts uh, that he'd run up in England by a very extravagant lifestyle. And this possibly in, uh, influenced him in inclu to, uh, to include what were, by the uh, standards of the day, highly unguarded uh, personal material. The excellent plates but, uh, to the memoirs by the uh, aforesaid Henry Alcan, uh, accompanied by witty and comical letterpress, also added to the appeal of the book. Much of Nimrod's volume is spent on anecdotes of Mitten's more harebrained activities, his gleeful stories about the squire's pet bear. So Mitten kept a brown bear in his residence and was in the habit of putting the animal to bed alongside several ferocious bulldogs with drunken house guests. He allows this bear the run of his baronial residence where it frequently chased the servants and developed a taste like Mitten for, for wine. And there's one famous escapade where Mitten mounted his ursine companion as if he were a chaser. He once rode this bear into the drawing room wearing his full hunting costume. The bear carried him very quietly for a time, but on being pricked by a spur, he bit the rider through the calf of his leg. And the animal is eventually uh, destroyed after a particularly violent assault on one of um, Mitten's servants. Nimrod passes over Mitten's schooling in a few words. He was expelled from Westminster, he was expelled from Harrow, and afterwards he knocked down his private tutor. He does nonetheless develop a talent for memorising from scripture and from the classics. The adult Mitten, though his hearing was impaired, combined a taste for uncouth jokes with a capacity to quote at length from Horace and Virgil and Sophocles. Mitten had no higher education. He was entered on the books of both universities, but did not matriculate at either. And the only outward and visible sign of his ever intending to do so was his ordering three pipes of wine to be sent addressed to him at Trinity College, Cambridge. And three pints of wine, it might be pointed out, is uh, 1,800 bottles of wine. So Nimrod has this kind of catalogue of comic catastrophes and, and, and anecdotes. And, and so on. But as, they, as the book goes on, the tone darkens. Wine, opines Nimrod sagely, 
is the grave of reason. And his subject was a stranger to sobriety from his school, school days to his death. And the memo memoirs catalogue this monumental intemperance. John Mitten drank morning, noon and night. Quote, he shaved with a bottle of wine in his toilet. He worked steadily at the bottle during the day, a glass or two at the time, and at least a bottle with his luncheon. And the after dinner and the after supper work, not leaving sight of the brandy bottle in the billiard room. John Mitten gambled frequently, profligately, and with a vengeful eye for the con man. John Mitten sported, owning dozens of horses, though with barely any of note. He hunted like a man possessed, plunging into lakes, wielding a shooting piece, or sitting aside his mare, hit and miss, laughing off pain, and riding with broken ribs and murmuring, says Nimrod. A sort of destroying spirit accompanied this man. And he proceeds through the book with a litany of antics and mishaps from the 14-year-old Mitten seeking leave to marry and arguing to a judge that his £600 a year allowance at Harrow was insufficient to his needs, to the squire in his pomp with his sports, tricks and dipsomaniac pets, to his decline, brawling with his estranged wife's burly manservants, drunken follies in France and paying a passing prostitute 500 guineas to become his common-law wife. Nimrod's finest and perhaps most characteristic story involves him in a personal capacity in Calais where the two debt-ridden gentlemen were evading their creditors. After a boozy evening, Mitten set the uh, tails of his nightshirt on fire in a drunken attempt to cure the hiccups. This seemed to have worked, but only at the risk of sudden death, from which only the, inter the intervention of Mitten's servant and an acquaintance spared him. Around midnight, he returned to a hotel, drunk and hiccuping. Damn this hiccup, said Mitten, as he stood undressed on the floor, apparently in the act of getting into bed, but I'll frighten it away. So, seizing a lighted cam candle, applied it to the tail of his shirt, it being a cotton one, he was instantly enveloped in flames. A fellow guest, a Mitten's servant, beat out the flames. The hiccup is gone, by God, he said, and reeled naked into bed. And Appley uh, visited Mitten in his room the next morning, quote, not only shirtless, but sheetless, with the skin of his breast, shoulders and knees of the same colour as a newly singed bacon hock. And Mitten tells Nimrod that he had barbecued himself on purpose in order to demonstrate how I can bear pain. And in his agonies, he recites accurately and beautifully, says Nimrod, the passage from Sophocles, where Oedipus commends his children to the care of Leon, uh, of Creon. So this is, this is uh, Alkin's take on that particular episode from the, from the memoirs. So you couldn't, to risk a cliche, make it up. Nonetheless, this is a very literary treatment, fashioning Mitten's life into a kind of Smilettian narrative of hijinks and broad humour. However original Appley's work may have been in terms of the literature of sport, this is a book with clear literary antecedents. Though, Mitten was, uh, though, though Nimrod was born genteel, his favourite reading was uh, rogue narratives, the kind of Newgate narratives, and also the picaresque fiction. When I was at rugby, says Appley, Tom Jones and Roderick Random were my favourites, and the little reading I have indulged in since has been of the best of this kind of novel. So the life of John Mitten clearly draws on the tradition of English picaresque. That said, picaresque novels do not normally end in the manner of Sophoclean tragedy, with the violent and ugly demise of the principal character. The tone of the memoirs darkens as the narrative progresses. There is more than mere hee-heeing in Appley's prose. In the end, he aims to squeeze the reader's tear. Nimrod is unsparing about Mitten's demise, and indeed captures, managed to capture some of the pathos of the man's late uh, l uh, last days. He plays for last in much of the memoir, but he also captures the pathos, the sadness of Mitten's gross physical decline. His last days of freedom, and I quote, as a half mad, half, a half mad hunted creature, a man who died a death as a round-shouldered, tottering, old, young man bloated by drink. So from the comic muse, 
is born a measure of the tragic and aptly says, the comedy is now at an end and something very like a tragedy succeeds to it. Among Apley's drolleries, there is a sense of lamentation about the restless and ultimately unhappy and unfulfilled life which John Mitten led. Now, Mitten's notion of pleasure, and uh, Nimrod explicitly discovers this, and his ability to experience pleasure were only of the moment, passing fancies, pleasures of no permanence. And Nimrod is explicit about this. Beyond the excitement of the passing moment, nothing afford afforded John Mitten sterling pleasure. He had a largeness of heart, but was undone by a lofty pride which disdained the littleness of prudence. His spirit was marred in its beauty, but forgetful of its own nobleness. He was faithful to his friends, an indulgent landlord, a most kind master. So, the comedy of rural life gives way to tragedy, as Nimrod's portrayal of Mitten as a modern-day Theban of Athens. With what extraordinary characters of ancient and modern times would John Mitten stand the comparison? With Nero? Yes, for Nero fiddled while Rome was burning, and Mitten would have laughed had he seen Holston in flames. But Nero murdered his mother, and Mitten made a noble provision for his. With Theban of Athens? Yes, as a spendthrift, but the one hated and the other was kind to all mankind. So, in conclusion, as Raymond Carr writes in his History of English Fox Hunting, Apley could see, sense the pathos of this reckless rider and disreputable gambler, cut off by deafness, as one of that small band of men who court affection, yet can only communicate through crude practical jokes. Nimrod knew that there was something monumental about John Mitten. And indeed, Virginia Woolf, in her 1932 Vogue review of a reprint of Nimrod's biography of Mitten, saw the very extremity of his life as the key to its appeal. We like these exhibitions of human nature, Woolf declares. Mitten becomes an exhibition, a spectacle. So this is the, the berserker, the uber sportsman, the hyper masculinity of late Georgian fox hunting in extremis. Woolf, who knew her Freud, saw him as the rampant id, a primeval man born in the Eng uh, England in the reign of George IV. Now, Wolf is one George out here, and perhaps it's better to see Mitten as freakishly typical, as a sporting spirit of the late Georgian age without trammel or restraint upon its pleasures, however momentarily. However, Wolf offers a, a much more insightful sentiment in her concluding remarks on Mitten. She writes brilliantly, we look upon John Mitten as one looks at something removed from of ordinary duties and ordinary joys, a monument, a menace with contempt and pity and some awe. Thank you.